First speaker in tonight's lineup will be Mr. Peter Brun, MA. He's a science graduate from Cambridge, former sharebroker, former grazier, currency and commodity trader, investor, and uh, currently treasurer of the HS Chapman Society. Um, and he also tells me that he has written a book of limericks. So he is a versatile man, versatile, and that last bit particularly convinced me that he is versatile. And I'd like you to welcome uh, Mr. Peter Burnley. Thank you very much. My talk this evening is, is going to encompass a few things. Um, I'm going to be quite brief about uh, UN Agenda 21 at Iclay and so on, because uh, I think a lot of you know about that. If you don't know about it, then um, I urge you to uh, look into it. There's a stack of stuff on the internet uh, from, from uh, both sides. But I am just going to talk a little bit about climate change and sustainability, because uh, they're pretty relevant to, to those that follow. Uh, then I've got a little cameo section which is about what the Waverley Council um, has on its environmental action plan. Uh, and uh, Waverley was actually the first one I looked at, but um, all, all the others have got something pretty similar. I looked at, at uh, Wallara, Leichhardt, Bathurst, Newcastle, and finally Moree. Moree one, I must say, was a little bit different from the others, but, but certainly those three um, metropolitan ones were, were very similar. Um, so, um, if we go on, um, now, I'm not, I make no apology for this. I have drawn my inf information on this from a number of sources um, who tend to be on the sceptical side of the argument. Uh, but I have um, read quite a bit of the IPCC stuff, and uh, there are certain things that uh, I certainly agree with what they say. So, now in 1991, ICLEI was set up, and um, the, the actual um, process in which all these things run is still rather confused in my mind, but um, um, ICLEI would appear to be the organization that pushes through the agenda to local councils. Uh, UN Agenda 21 signed at the Rio Earth Summit by uh, 178 countries, including Australia, ratified by our federal parliament in 1995. Um, in 1999, that's quite interesting, this was under coalition government, uh, and I uh, tend to vote that way, um, they passed the Environment Protection and Biodiversity Act, which is, which is pure ICLEI. Um, so um, ICLEI embraces climate change, sustainability, and biodiversity. Um, I, I was going to produce a handout of, of various um, books and publications and websites. I'm sorry I haven't done it. Um, I, if, if, if somebody wants that stuff, if they see me afterwards or give, give their name to the desk, I, I, can, uh, I can furnish them with that. Um, now, um, I, I'm not impressed by IPCC, I have to say. Um, and based on what I've read by Donna Laframboise in her book, The delinquent teenager and, uh, and Bob Carter in his, uh, um, um, I think it's called Climate Change, the Counter Consensus, the IPCC comes out pretty badly and could be described as mendacious, fraudulent, corrupt, brainwashing and a sensorial gravy chain. <laughs> train. Um, now let's just have a look at a few graphs on the climate change thing. Now a lot of you will be familiar with this. Um, it's the last uh, 550 million years ago and the significant thing there is that all larger life forms, both um, plant and marine, land, uh, sorry, plant and animal, um, land and marine, developed during that period uh, where you see the red line um, um, falling down to a very low level um, at about 300 million years ago. Now, um, that, that shows you that carbon dioxide was a great deal higher back in those times and uh, the great carbon, uh, the great coal fields of the world, a lot of them were laid down in that period from uh, about 350 million years ago to 250, roughly. I mean, we don't mind about a million years here or there, really, do we? Um, and uh, you can see from that that uh, there are times when they move together, but, but there are times when they don't. Uh, anyway, in terms of, of, the, um, of the Earth's history, uh, carbon dioxide levels, according to the, this data, which is admittedly proxy data from, from uh, radio, 
um, radioactive isotopes and, and, and so on, um, uh, is, is, at a very, is at a very low level. Um, incidentally, one thing that's quite interesting, which I haven't shown there, you will see that, that at about 250 million years ago, the, um, sorry, I've got to stand by this thing, um, carbon dioxide suddenly took a leap. Now, that coincided with, with the uh, end of the Permian period, which was called the Permian extinction, where vast um, basalt uh, fields were laid down in what is now Siberia, and, um, I mean, more than 95% of, of life on Earth was killed. Um, now, uh, the last um, million years, um, we, are, we are in a warm period, as you see, and um, most of the time, I, you have to admit, it has not been much fun. And, uh, I mean, if, as, as long as it doesn't affect us, but it, it is going to happen eventually. It's hard to imagine that carbon dioxide alone is going to save the situation. Now, is carbon dioxide at a high level historically? The answer is, yes, it is. But, should we be afraid of that? And the answer is, no, we shouldn't. Because the warming effect of carbon dioxide declines logarithmically. And from where we are now, uh, every increment in carbon dioxide produces a very small warming effect. Apparently it never gets completely flat, but you can see that it's pretty obvious. Um, there are a few other matters. Um, the computer models that are used, computers are great things, and they certainly help research. Uh, but the, um, what, what, what computer models have relied on um, for... for um, uh, a lot of their forecasts is what is called positive feedback, which is that um, water vapor, which is much larger as greenhouse gas, um, uh, the warming effect of that is enhanced by increases in carbon dioxide. Now, according to David Evans, and I can give you his details, you can find them on the internet, but he, um, he writes quite extensively on this and he says that, um, that using positive feedback is not supported empirically. Uh, computer models, well, we know what lousy forecasters are, they can't forecast them a, week, a couple of weeks ahead or anything. Ocean acidification, uh, Professor Bob Carter of James Cook University tells me this is a very complicated issue. Um, uh, he's had great difficulty explaining it to non-scientists. I'm not going to talk about it now, but I can uh, give you information on that if you wish. Uh, well, this is just a brief thing showing uh, the greenhouse gases are in order of importance. Um, it, it's um, just more or less, as I said, uh, water vapor is much the most important. Um, now here's, here's the infamous hockey stick. And when, and when I use the word fraudulent to describe the activities of uh, the IPCC, this was a gigantic fraud, and it's been proved to be, and now they do not show it in the IPCC reports anymore. Uh, just a little bit on, on the more recent history of the Earth's temperature. Um, you can see that um, historically we're, we're, we're in a warm period, but by no means the warmest. Um, are cyclones increasing? No. Um, we, we hear a lot about them, but it ain't happening. Just uh, as a matter of interest, I was born in the county of Norfolk in England, and I have a rather interesting book here, which is about the Norfolk and Suffolk weather from about 1800, and I can tell you they had a pretty bad time in the 1800s. Uh, the, the, um, the 20th century was a lot kinder. Um, CO2 is not a pollutant. Well, you all know that. It dissolves, dissolves more freely in colder water than warmer. The ocean contains 50 times as much as the atmosphere, and, and CO2 is in continual flux in and out of the oceans. Ice core analysis shows that the Earth warms first, and carbon dioxide in in uh, levels increase later, not the other way around. Submarines are air conditioned to 7,000 parts per million. I don't think we've got too much to worry about at 400 parts per million. Um, CO2 is a, part, a plant food. You can see along the bottom there, you've got, you've got this is obviously ex an experiment, and it shows you how much more plants grow when, when the uh, carbon dioxide level is higher. Um, we see these all the time. That it, what you see is steam. If you look at the two, what, what you we've called smokestacks, which in fact come from the, uh, the coal burners, there's nothing coming out. Of course you don't. Carbon dioxide is colourless. It's also odourless and non-toxic. Um, this is not quite up to date, this map, but it, it, I'll, I'll show you an up-to-date one in a moment. But 
Um, it does show you how carbon dioxide has continued to increase while the, the, uh, the trend in, uh, in temperature is, uh, um, well, actually, quite frankly, it's all over the bloody place. But, uh, I mean, that's the nature of climate. It is all over the place. I mean, look, look at that. This is, these are the satellite-based temperature. This is the satellite-based temperature record. Um, and, and that's when it started. It doesn't go back before that. But, um, I mean, a lot of the smaller fluctuations are, are because there's much more land in the northern hemisphere than there is in the south. Um, so, um, who knows where it's going to go from here. Um, now, okay, that's all I'm going to say about climate change. Um, you may disagree with me. Well, okay. Uh, sustainability. Now, we, we hear some most extraordinary things about it, about agriculture. Modern agriculture is a miracle. I mean, if you go back in time, um, farmers had, had an appalling time. They really did. And maybe they will again. But at the moment, um, they're, they're, they're meeting uh, the world's requirements. Um, there are a lot of things that are important. Now, I was brought up on a farm in England, and I can tell you that the land went from, from heavy land that had to be drained uh, uh, to sort of really nice, loamy soils and um, uh, to, to very light land where, where shelter was important, so you had to have shelter lots and so on. The, these things, uh, I mean, you know, the Greens agree with us on all these matters. There's no argument about them. There have been mistakes in the past, of course, but practices have been uh, continually improving. And in that respect, I would suggest, and I'll talk later on this about the, um, what's some, what happened to some of the farmers, that the carrot is much more effective than the stick. Um, Australian soils have vastly increased productivity since the arrival of the white man. Um, you go to India like 50 years ago, maybe the population was uh, 400 million. Today it's 1.2, and they're self-sufficient in food. No, it, it, it's a miracle. Um, where there is food scarcity, you'll probably find this foreign aid, corruption, ignorance, and malpractice. Israel, a dry, barren country, is a food exporter. Remarkable. Um, in terms of the countryside, I mean, there, there are many parts of the, of the world which have um, been settled for thousands of years. The land is fashioned by mankind, as is Australia. Um, National parks. I love national parks. I do a lot of bushwalking. It, and, um, I think where there are fragile ecosystems like mountains, floodplains, wetlands, and coastlines, great places for national parks. Um, but under the UN agenda, they are talking about 50% um, human-free habitat and 10% buffer. Now, what, what does this mean? Well. There are, there are a lot of exotic plants in our national parks, make no mistake. Just, just to mention um, two, you've got blackberries and lantana. And uh, they're, they're out of control. Uh, and then you've got feral animals. They tell me there are 10 million cats in Australia. Well, I, I believe if you told me there were 20 or 5, it wouldn't make any difference. And then you've got flower and flood and storms. Now, the, this is um, a map of the US, as you can see, and that shows the, the um, planned areas of, um, of land use under the st sustainable program uh, where um, man is uh, excluded from 50% of, of the land, there's a 10% buffer where basically, which is also basically human free and man is required to live in the other, in the other uh, 40%. Uh, I'm not going to go into that anymore, there's a wealth of stuff on, on the internet. Um, um, as I said before, the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act was passed by the coalition government. But what, what you had agenda about is green utopian idealism, which will turn Australia into a socialist state. Um, under uh, Habitat 141, which is an area in Victoria and South Australia, I think a bit of New South Wales, um, there's a large area there where, um, which is going to be reserved for wildlife, um, land and corridors and so on unbroken chains of, of human-free habitat. Um, so, sounds wonderful, but uh, uh, I, I, I think that uh, the costs and the problems that would be associated with that um, would, would, uh, would be more than, than we reckon on. Um, and it's also involved in large, um, and take over large areas of private land. Who pays? Well, of course, the taxpayer pays. Uh, I mean, this, this, this um, 
uh, locking up land and putting in managers and all the rest of it is completely unsound economics. And we all know about the failure of socialism that's been demonstrated time and time again. And why, why is the earth so holy? I mean, is, is, it, is it the fate of the earth to, to wind up as a useless rock in space like pretty well everything else? Um, I'll leave a little bit out there. The, uh, oh yes, in, in terms of uh, Agenda 21, there are now eight American states uh, which have banned or are in the process of banning UN um, Agenda 21. Oh, this is Habitat 141. You can see that, that red area there. Um, uh, that, that's the area that it covers. This is a, a more detailed map, but I'm afraid it's rather blurred and I haven't got a key for it. I'm sorry about that. Um, now, I'm actually going to, going to just leave it here for a moment and, and go to... Um, um, if I can make this thing work the way I want it to... Uh, go to the, uh, the Waverley Environmental Action Plan. Um, am I running out of time? No. Oh, good. good. All right, now, I know some of the people involved uh, with the Waverley Council. They're liberal endorsed uh, councillors, and uh, Sally Betts has been there, and is a nice woman, and we get on well. I'm amazed. I'm absolutely amazed at this stuff. I mean, go and look at it. There's 50 odd pages of it. Um, I, I'm flipping through this. Don't, don't even bother to look at it uh, at the moment. Um, well, there's a bit here. I don't know whether you can read that. You probably can't. Um, I'll just have to go to the other, the other little thing I've got here. Um, Okay, welcome to the brave new world of green, sustainable, biodiversified Waverley. <laughs> ah, well, these people are pretty keen to get us all believing this stuff. There's a lot in here about, um, about sustainability, education, and engagement. This is unbelievable stuff. Um, and this is all based on fear of increasing carbon dioxide and, and runaway global warming. I mean, right at its very premise, it has got no basis. Look, we all, none of us like rubbish. I walk a lot and I run a lot. Clean up Australia Day was what, a couple of weeks ago or something? It's rubbish everywhere. Within two weeks of clean up, you know, there's a big job. We agree on that front. Something needs to be done. Uh, but I don't know how it's going to be done. I mean, it gets enough publicity as it is. But, um, and we can't all please each other. Um, no, I'll just go on a bit. Um, as I said, this is meant to be the comedy section of it, but I think you'll find that there isn't a comedy in it. Well, well this, is, this is quite funny, really, uh, because you can see here, look, 30% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by 2020. I mean, little old Waverley will not say, sure, I can fix that, you know. Um, uh, of course, it will need the help of everywhere else, including a whole lot of foreign countries, so what am I now? Average kilometres travelled by Waverley residents per day by private car to decline by 15% to 2050, based on kilometres travelled in 2006. They're, they're, they're quite lucky, haven't they? Um, and 40% of daily distance travel by residences by public transport, walking or cycling. Now I will tell you the fate of cycling. There's a man called Dr. Greg Levinson, who's a very nice guy, he's on the Wallara Council. He stood for pre-selection in the state seat of Waverley, uh, of, of all clues. And uh, one of the things there, they have these, they have the various candidates um, sitting at tables with the pre-selectors and for eight to 10 pre-selectors. Um, I'm, I'm 71. I would have been the youngest person sitting around that table. And he proceeded to tell us that uh, he thought we should be riding bicycles <laughs> to a group of people for which I was the youngest. I ride It's a dangerous business. You know how many votes he got? Zero. <laughs> um, water. Look, I agree with a lot of the, the things about water. I'm very water conscious. Um, I, I think, you know, that side of it's good. How you really do it effectively, I, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that their program would, would really do it. But uh, I, I support that sort of thing. 
And now we come, this, this, this is pantomime. Increase the connectivity of wildlife habitat corridors by 2020. Now, what, what are they talking about? This, this is Waverley. You know, it's got some parts, I know. But I mean, they've got a, no hope in hell. You know, um, flora and flora extinctions. You know, no localized extinction of marine intertidal species. Well, I mean, and they, they don't know when to stop. Continually, uh, continually improve the quality and ensure no loss of native vegetation. Um, again, I don't. I, I mean, look, look. I, I live, I live pretty close to New South Head Road. And there's a nice little, little green bit there which uh, looks out over the harbour and all the rest. Of it. It's got lantana growing in it, you know. Um, uh, yeah, I, I don't know what to say, but I, I, I just think that these, these people, it's pie in the sky, it really is. Um, and, of course, you know, transport. Well, I'll tell you a very interesting thing now. Now, not many of you will know this, but carbon has a great, in, in a reaction, has a great affinity for oxygen. When hydrocarbons, which is petrol, is burned in a car, the hydrogen, which does have a, a greater warming effect than carbon, doesn't burn until it gets into the exhaust chamber, so it provides no power at all. So you see these buses running around, you know, saying, you know, on, on, on natural gas and clean energy and all the rest of it. The energy is coming from carbon. That comes from a man I met who works out at Lucas Heights, by the way. Um, uh, and of course, they're big on this staff engagement and education. I mean, you know, it's, it's no good working for well, our uh, Waverley Council if you don't believe all that stuff. So. Um, food miles. Now, now, look, we, li we live in a, an age of plenty. Uh, we, we get vegetables from Queensland in the winter. We get all sorts of things from overseas, everywhere else. There's, there's vast trade. Uh, there's specialization. We live in an age where we don't have to grow everything ourselves, where it doesn't all have to be grown locally. Isn't this a good thing? I would say it was. Uh, but anyway, they, they want to reduce the distance that food comes to get into our mouths. I mean, I ask you. Um, and uh, then, of course, residential transportation. Well, they want us to walk and use bicycles. Um, by the way, I told you I cycle. Um, I'm pretty wary where I go. The only time I ride any distance on my bike uh, on the roads is early on Sunday morning. Um, I certainly don't do it in Russia. Um, residential transport, I mean, you know, I, I don't know, I haven't been to China, but, you know, they, they were all riding bicycles. Um, I've got Danish antecedents. I remember uh, being in Denmark in the late 1950s, and uh, there were so many bicycles being used that um, you know you could hardly get out onto a main road. It's not like that now. So this little plan is going backwards. Um, uh, this is the most absurd of the law: community engagement in education. They want people in penthouses to put in worm farms. <laughs> What's this? Worm farms in penthouses. Give me another one. Uh, anyway, you had enough of that. There, there's, there's more of that stuff. How about this? Residents allow residents to celebrate positive environmental behaviour through running and supporting local sustainability events. <laughs> Anybody been to one of those? <laughs> <laughs> Visitors, well, they're, they're going to be subject to the same thing. And the council employees implement and rule. An implement a reward and recognition program for staff who practice positive environmental behaviours. <laughs> well, that's it. Oh, I won't waste any more time. But you can go to their website and, and, and look at it. it it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's crazy stuff. Um, anyway, I'll get rid of that now. And now I come to the story of John and Lynn uh, Hudson. And the, whilst that might have been the comedy section, this is the tragedy section. Um, no, I've just got to get that up here. Uh, I'll close that down. Uh, uh, here it is. I'm, I, I'm actually going to read this, and I make no apology for it, because um, I, I didn't have time to, to brace it. Uh, in 2004, John and Lynn Hudson, Hudson purchased your uh, Yawal, which is near Maureen, by the way. Um, in northern New South Wales at public auction. Um, 
uh, it was later revealed in the media that this was had an important area on it for breeding birds. Uh, they said, well, why wasn't it purchased by the government? Well, I mean, it may well be it wasn't government policy at the time or, or whatever, it was slipped under the radar. So. But for three years, John worked with an officer of the CMA, and the CMA is the... Um, Yes, the, the Catchment Management Authority, okay, uh, and, and others to control classified noxious weed Lipia. Finally, in 2007, he got the all clear from the officer to clear the land in question, stick break it, plow it, and plant a crop uh, for three and a half, three to five years, and then return it to native pasture, and so on. Um, in May 2007, uh, Department of Environmental and uh, Climate Change. Uh, what's this? and water uh, officers um, left a note saying they, they've been looking at the clearing. Um, on the 20th of May, the Sydney Morning Herald rang looking for John and Lynn and said the government had told them there had been 750 to 1,500 hectares of bird environment cleared on your roll and that it would be in the papers the following uh, and the radio uh, tomorrow. Okay. Um, the headlines in the radio, okay, wetlands disaster, an international bird habit had been cleared, habitat had been cleared, and their names were published in the paper. Uh, an officer from the DECC rang John and Lynn and left a message saying this information had not come from the DECC. He didn't know where it had come from. Um, Minister Koperberg reported on radio saying that the owners would be charged in the next few days and be fined a million dollars each. Now, a million dollars to a farmer is a lot of money. I can tell you, farming is a tough world out there. There are all sorts of things you've got to put up with. And then on top of that, a million dollars each. I mean, I, I mean, it would have broken most people, wouldn't it? And indeed, it, this sort of thing has seen a lot of people leave the land, make no mistake. Um, and then uh, they heard nothing from the DECC. Uh, uh, until May the 30th, I well, said a week later, uh, and um, uh, enabled with warrants and authorization of entry. Um, um, well, apparently no one lived in the neighbor's house. They broke the hinges off the gate in the cattle yards and entered there as the main gate was locked. Now, I, I, I don't know, some of you may find this stuff hard to believe, but um, uh, there's an a organization called the Kiwi Property Rights based in Coft Harbour. Uh, and I was up there about three weeks ago um, uh, attending a little uh, conference on, on such things. And we heard this sort of story in one form or another. Again, when I say we, that's Dr. Amy McGrath who wrote, the, um, who wrote this book, Wolves in Sheep's Clothing, which, which some of you will be familiar with. Uh, if you want copies of that, you can, you can ask me afterwards. Uh, Peter. Have we run out of time? About four minutes, Peter. Sorry? About four, four minutes. Four minutes to go, okay. Um, well, well, so it went on uh, with, with um, these, these officers arriving at the property and, uh, and so on. And they, and they were pretty brutal. Here's a bit where they, they stormed in past Lynn and went to the office where they raided all the cupboards and lockers. Um, and the officer tried to interview their sons and two workers do you get paid, how many cattle, and, and a whole lot of other questions, which, which would hardly have seemed relevant in, in terms of, of uh, the, this business of, of the uh, Lipia. Um, and uh, the officer took their computer and, and those various other things there. Um, I even two, found two books of their son's uh, bank transactions. Um, I mean, what they had to do with it, I don't know. And they took photographs and, and all this sort of thing. Anyway, um, um, this went on, and it and I and it's still going on. Um, and um, Lynn says all this was very intimidating and harassing, and, and uh, an intrusion of privacy. The media in the wilderness took up the stories, uh, and from that we were crucified. And she said, "This is not an international bird habitat. It is not heritage listed. Maybe it should have been, but it wasn't. And anyway, it had an infestation of this uh, this lipia." Now, uh, I'll go on quickly here because we're running out of time. It's a little bit about the fines they paid. Um, the, um, the local member apparently uh, uh, didn't help them. Um, and uh, there's a piece. Um, well, eventually, um, the, uh, uh, some of the... Oh, here we are. 
2010, 10, it says the feds pulled out and the case was dismissed, costs were awarded. But the remediation order was still in place. And, uh, uh, but then, then uh, it says the conviction and the remediation order stayed, but the fine was dismissed to go back to Land and Environment Court for resentencing. And I think that is where they still are. Um, and then it says, this land is now a jungle, worse than ever. It is unviable. Uh, these people have no idea this land is taken over by pigs and the regrowth and rubbish is so thick. And then she's got a bit at the end, invasion of privacy, trespass on private land, trial by media, bullying tactics, etc., etc. 